Bada bing, bada boom, the YouTube says we're live and welcome to a fine November 8th. It's currently covered in snow outside in here, beautiful Saskatchewan, Canada. The city I live in is actually called Regina. It's like Regina, but the queen at the time pronounced her name Regina, which is unfortunate when we travel. But you guys, we're going to have a really fun live tonight. Fun because you guys are always fun. And and tonight's live, I would say, is really mostly about you in the way that these are the best when you guys just answer, ask questions and we get to answer those questions. But I did have a little bit of a moment of inspiration that we're going to talk about a little bit later. I feel like I have a hair in my mouth. Ugh, not the best. Um, you know, around this idea of growing and growth. And and this isn't a, hey, here's how you can grow and have as many subs as me, because that, that would kind of be silly. Although I will say, I what am I currently at? 9,938 subscribers. We're going to hit 10,000 subscribers. And some people say the first 10,000 is the hardest milestone to hit. And everyone is harder after, easier after that, which I was looking at. I think I have 376 public videos it's a lot of videos to get there and a lot of time, but I, I've loved every single minute of it. But we're going to talk about this idea of growth, of challenging yourself to grow, of in some ways your, your channel will grow, but growing in creativity, growing in skills and, and how important that is. And then uh, we do have some new gear and I, I like talking about gear, even though gear can be the number one thing that actually keeps people from creating. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit too, but it's going to be a really, really fun night. So Whenever you have comments and different things, uh, just drop it in the comments section and we're going to answer some comments. And comments, the Mitten Dad says hi. Hey, Mitten Dad, uh, thank you for coming to hang out live. Dave Altizer, I'm so jealous of you, Dave. I see your stupid, sunny California pictures. Meanwhile, we're blanketed in snow here. Today's high, today's high was minus 11 degrees Celsius, the high in the middle of the afternoon. It's November 8th. Why do we live here? It's crazy. Love you too, Dave. De DeFi, is it DeFi? Does that make, or is Def, it wouldn't be Defi. That'd be like Defecate. DeFi TV. Good morning from Thailand. Oh, it could be. Anyway, good morning, guys. Welcome to the stream. Anna Adams, almost at 10K. Hey, oh, Steve Tech Guy. Hello, fellow Canadians. I always... Love finding more and more fellow Canadians. Uh, Jay Royal says, I so do. Very nice. Hey, cool story today. Friends of this channel, Becky and Chris, who we actually interviewed them live right here. I mean, they weren't here. They were in Buffalo, I think, at the time. Were they in Buffalo or no? I can't remember where they were. Might have been the east coast of Canada. Um, you know, Canadian friends... Back when we interviewed them, their channel was a good chunk smaller, but they have just continued to crush out some unreal content. It's fun, and it's it's cool, and I love the style of it. I love the editing. I actually, the color grading on it, I just, like, I wish I could do it. I'm just, I can't because I'm not that good. But anyway, their, their stuff looks awesome, uh, Becky and Chris. Well, they had a big, big day today because... Chris went on a little trip. Chris is a helicopter pilot, and I've seen his helicopter in so many videos. I'm watching Potato Chet's video, and he showed up at Maddie Hapoya's studio. I was like, that's Maddie Hapoya's studio. And then Maddie walks into the frame, and it's a funny little bit, but then they go for a helicopter ride in Chris's helicopter. Well, today he dropped a video at the same time as Peter McKinnon because they went on a nice little bro date. They landed on this tiny little island in northern Ontario in Canada somewhere. Anyway, super fun, super cool vlog. To be fair, I've only watched Becky and Chris's vlog yet. I haven't watched Peter's vlog yet, but they have added just under, uh, they're about 300 away from adding 8,000 subscribers today. They were at like 13,700 earlier today, 21,477. Nice little break, but it they didn't just catch the break because Peter talked about them in the video they caught the break because they make really, really good content. They do it consistently on the weekly, and it and it just it's good stuff. And they're quirky and fun. They just own who they are. Um, actually, Becky and I are jumping on a call tomorrow morning. Uh, anyway, we'd set this up. I guess kind of just as they're blowing up unintentionally, but uh, to talk about creating some more content together. So that will be super, super cool. Anyway, uh, super cool. Super cool. Do I just keep saying super, super, super cool? That's uh, interesting. Steve Tech Guy, Winterpeg. I'm in Saskatchewan, which is like 
I don't know. Well, I mean, you're Canadian, you probably know. I'm in Regina, which is like five, six hour drive away from Winnipeg, very close. Steve Tech Guy says, Why didn't you keep the M50? Not even for a small travel cam. Um, I guess for me, I'm just like, there are certain people who take different cameras for different things. I just, I, I just can't do it. I'm just like, I want to have the camera with me. And this is small, right? It's, it's not small, but I have a bag that fits it. So, you know, I could see myself actually potentially buying another M50, but here's, here's a top tech tip, top tip, tech, 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 tip. Camera bodies depreciate camera lenses kind of take their initial hit of depreciation and they don't really depreciate. The problem is when you hang on to camera bodies and you're not really using them, they're just kind of losing their value because new ones come out, whereas lenses, I mean, new lenses do come out, but not on the same frequency. I have a Sony RX100 Mark V that I bought in May and I bought it and then like a month later, they announced the Mark VI and I just need it for one project. I need to make two videos with it and I paid after batteries, and this is Canadian land, I paid about $1,450. And right now, I can't sell it for $850 Canadian, which is like, I don't know, $650 US with two extra good batteries? Like, it's crazy, but they depreciate. So if I'm not using a camera, I typically just sell it because I could always buy another one, you know? And yeah, maybe the price would be a little bit different. But if you don't know if you're going to use it, for me, I'm just like, I just, I just sell it. And... The M50 is wild and amazing, and if you guys didn't see my last video, what you can do with it is absolutely bonkers. But for me, it's like, I'm just going to sink my teeth into this, use this, and you know, if I end up not liking it, I'll sell it and I could buy another M50 plus a whole lot more stuff because it's so expensive. Um, yeah, cool stuff. Uh, what else? Joy Royal, Mississauga in the house. Hey, man, Ontario representation. A lot of Canadians... Acura addicted another fellow Canadian. Greetings from Toronto. Guys, it's a Canadian live show tonight, which is good. Uh, but, I mean, we also have Thailand and we have Western USA now, Dave. Um, anyway, so topic of the night tonight. So I pull up my chair because it needs to get moved up. Is around this idea of growth. And growth is is really, really important. Now, the thing that can be a little bit weird about growth is you don't necessarily get to control the growth all the time in some situations, meaning the growth of your YouTube channel. <laughs> Becky and Chris are learning today that, you know, it was a series of like a lot of hard work put into videos that came to fruition in a moment of time where Chris got to hang out with Peter McKinnon, who obviously has a massive audience and together that has spiked their growth. But can they just make that happen any day? No, but they could control the outcome of continuing to create great content. And for all of us on our channels or in our own creative world is we can control putting in the work, but that doesn't necessarily directly correlate to the growth in something like subscribers or followers or things like that. But there are parts of growth that we have complete control over. And one of those things would be developing your skills is there is so much free information out there for growing your skills, both technical skills, but also storytelling skills. And those things are going to lead to the growth of every other area. And I think the M50 video that I did is a perfect example where we're taking what is now, I just actually looked, $629 for that body. And then obviously, yeah, you would need to invest in lenses, new other things. But to create the quality of video that I did, which is not the world's greatest video, but a very, very well put together video was really about skills. It was about story scaling skills and it was about the technical skills to be able to make that camera work how I wanted it to work. And you can invest in gear, but it's your skills that are going to trump that gear for sure, which is kind of hypocritical to say, because obviously I, I love gear too, but for me, gear is always an impetus for me to help grow my skills because I keep trying other things. But I the interesting thing about this video that I did, again, this, this M50 video, which is the last video on my channel, was I remember having the idea, because I came from a vlogging background. I know how to create vlog-style content, but when I thought of this video, I thought what this video needs is actually voiceover cutting in and out of vlogs with music and fancy B-roll. And I remember sitting there before we actually decided to do the video that way. 
because this was, I mean, this was our buddy Scott, and this was like a big, you know, paid gig for him, and, and we got a little bit of something for helping out with it, which was awesome. But I remember sitting there and thinking, what if I screw this up? Can I even do this? I don't know if I can do this. And I remember actually putting out a tweet, something to the effect of like, whenever you have those moments where you think, I'm not sure I can do this, those are the moments you need to go all in because whenever you live inside your comfort zone, you don't grow. And the only way to grow is to actually push yourself outside of your comfort zone and try things that you haven't tried before, which is always scary because it could go wrong. And even in the case of this video, it could have gone wrong, but it actually worked out really well, really, really well. And it was actually nice because I'm learning the skill of adding voiceover that helps you tell a better story quicker because you can show footage while you're talking about it, as opposed to when you're vlogging, typically you got to take your camera and say, okay, guys, we're just now here in my basement and what we're doing is this, this, and this. You can do that much quicker with voiceover and you can actually begin to show what you're talking about, which is, yeah, really, really handy. But that was a moment of growth for me where I was like, I want to try this out. Do you guys remember these sunglasses? What did I use them last time? Anyway, how awesome are these? Super cool. But um, yeah, it's this idea of you growing your skills and challenging yourself to do things outside of the box is going to be the thing that actually, that's a growth that you can control that is going to help lead you into the growth that you can't control, which is sometimes just the outcomes are getting lucky, which is, yeah, interesting. So Roger, Sarah, another Canadian, Steve Tech Guy, Burlington, Ontario, and my TSX still rolls. Oh man, talking to Acura on there. Jay Ross says, on the subject of growth, do you feel you need those big breaks, whether it's a major shout out or crazy viral video or two, or is consistent quality enough for exponential growth? I think that is a fantastic question because, I mean, I look at this channel and if you're jumping in a little bit later, yeah, I'm going to roll over 10,000 subscribers in the next two or three days, which people say is it's very difficult to get to 10,000 subscribers. I don't think I had any big breaks, 376 videos and about to roll over 10,000. No, no real breaks. I never got any big shout outs on any channels. Peter McKinnon commented on one of my videos, you know, that felt nice. And, you know, like a couple of minor collaborations, but I haven't really had a chance to do too much. You know, a little bit with Dave from Kinotika, Brandon Washington, you know, some little things, but we were all like similar size. We were all at like six or 7,000 subscribers when we did that. And it has just been a case of slowly plodding along. And for me, like, this isn't this isn't a full-time gig for me. YouTube is, you know, essentially was a hobby in my like evenings and weekends to do a little bit here. And I have ideas and wishes for things that I want to create on this channel and to really take the quality up a massive notch. But for me, I'm a dad. I've got three kids. I've got a wonderful, amazing wife, um, you know, and I've got a business and this whole other side thing that we're pushing into, Justin and Greg, that that doesn't always leave as many cycles for this or the cycles that I do have are from nights like tonight, like 8 p.m. till, you know, midnight. And it's dark outside and you can't just go shoot and it's, you know, 10 degrees below zero. And some of that stuff makes it a little bit tougher to always do what you want to do, but it's not an excuse to just not create. And so I've kind of done the best that I could given the circumstances where it's just been videos in my basement trying to provide as much value as I can. And the growth has just kind of come slowly over time that, you know, it started off with, I remember thinking about getting to, I, I knew a guy who had 1,800 subscribers. And I thought, wow, that would be insane to get there. You know, but you just kind of keep creating videos and some of them had 50 views and some of them got to 100 views and 150 and you keep creating enough videos and some of them get picked up in the algorithm. And I remember these videos about the Panasonic G7 that I was sh I'm shooting on right now is that was kind of some of the early videos that really began to pop and you know, I'd get 10,000 views on a video because it got into the search algorithm. That, those were like, I think the biggest video I have has 60,000 views where I was talking about switching Canon cameras and it has a lot of thumbs down because people didn't agree with me. I think slightly more thumbs up. But yeah, I don't think you need exponential growth to get into the stratosphere. I think you can grind your way there. But what's interesting is the more that you do the consistent things and the more that you begin to hit at least a critical mass and for me i feel like once i hit ten thousand, it's just going to open up a little bit of doors for collaboration with other people because it it just gives you a little bit more street cred that then it's going to open up more growth opportunities so i don't know that for sure but 
it's interesting to see now where I'm I'm starting to now begin to have conversations with people that I didn't have, you know, even three months ago. And I'm beginning to connect with some other creators. And, you know, I think it's just the consistent. You put out hundreds of videos. Eventually, some people are going to see them too, you know. And so it's just opened up some more doors. So the big breaks help, but you don't get the big breaks without putting in the consistent work. I just think that's that's how it goes. So uh, promomovies.com.au. Hey, Justin Green from Australia. Oh, Love it from all around the world. Hey guys, welcome. Uh, Steve Tech Guy says quality, so quality over quantity mostly. And yeah, I would say I've put out a lot of videos on this channel that aren't really that quality, that the audio's bad. I would say value over everything. Now, quality, yeah, like I look at like Becky and Chris, like they put out quality videos. Like they're they're really, really quality. They're well shot, they're well edited, the color grades are beautiful, and and they do that. And that's really worked for them. And I'm jealous of the consistency of, I feel like if you go watch the last 50 videos that they've done, that they all feel like they're they're consistent in the quality and in the production, the execution. I would say my stuff is all over the map. And part of that is because my personality is I'm just an experimenter. I love to experiment all the time. I like changing the backgrounds and changing the lighting and trying different cameras and different lenses and different settings and and just always, but that's how I've kind of iterated my way into getting where I am because I didn't have any background in video or photo until probably like, is it four? It's probably not even four years ago, three years ago, where I was like, I want to learn more about photos so I can take better pictures of my kids. And somebody gave me the Canon F1.8 to try out for a 50 millimeter F1.8. This this exact, not this exact lens, but the same lens to try out for a couple of days. And it just like blew my mind when I learned how to use aperture. And then that kind of, I was into photos for a while and I've only been doing video stuff for like two years. And so I don't have the background that other people have in it where they're, you know, they're, they're better at it. So I had to learn it very quickly and I do it through a thousand micro iterations I think the worst thing you can do is not put something out because the quality isn't where you want it to be. It's like, just put it out there and keep going and keep going. That could be bad advice, but so far that's worked for me. Just like get a thousand ideas, just keep trying things, keep iterating. And you learn very quickly because I would say in two years, how much my skills have progressed from, you know, it's 376 videos on this channel. Well, I've got another 70 or 80 videos on another channel, plus a whole bunch of other videos I've shot for other people. And you just like, you just got to do it a ton and you can learn a lot quicker. So, you know, is it the best strategy for growth? I don't know. But sometimes just putting a lot out there, you find out what sticks. You can learn a little bit, a little bit quicker. So Pro Movie says, totally agree, Justin. You need to be thrown in the deep end sometimes, help you learn and deal with high pressure. Yeah. And and that's the truth is like we all don't actually understand how capable we are and what we can actually pull out until you really push yourself. And I think lots of times we doubt ourselves or we underestimate what we're capable of. One of the best ways to find out is to just get put in a situation where you're like, I just, I got to go for this. I just got to try it. I got to, I got to make this happen some way. And it ends up being, yeah, really, really good. So it's cool. Steve Tech Guy says, I think the final editing is key because you could record a great clip, but it's omitted for different reasons from the final video. Yeah, this is an interesting thing. For a while there, when I was vlogging, I was trying to force myself to always cut something that I thought was good, but maybe wasn't great. And what's crazy is we have this whole other channel, Justin and Greg, which on YouTube is it's not that big. There's about 4,000 or so subscribers. But on Facebook, it's had a lot of traction. It's had videos that have done over 10 million views and a number of viral things. And, and we've gotten tons of media attention. It's kind of this whole massive media platform, which is, which is cool online and offline. But there, we're finding so much more value in instead of making a 30 minute long good vlog, which is still good 30 minutes of content, how much people just love a condensed two minutes that just feels wild and insane. And a few people you can click through to the longer forms, but of just taking out everything else but the best bits you can create something that's pretty magical. I kind of buck that for YouTube because on YouTube, I like as a consumer, I actually want longer content to watch. Like, cause I want to come here and watch things, not just like hype two minute cuts, but on Facebook, it works great. And I mean, for commercial stuff that, that works great, but I think less is more. Absolutely. Um, Accurate Dick said, Justin, I want to thank you. You're the one few people who helped inspire me to start my own channel. I really use some of your tips for my work. Thanks. Thank you for that feedback. Cause I mean, I don't do this for the money, although it'd be nice someday, but uh, awesome. I just like, I love hearing people who just started and I got inspired by 
my man, Gary V. I keep this book. You can't really see it, but pull it down here. All right. Uh, this is Ask Gary V. And this was the book that I read. I was like three pages in when I started my vlog. And he was just talking about how people always talk about stuff that they're going to do, and then they never actually do something. I was like, cool, I got to do something. And I went and made my first vlog with like, I think, was it my, I think it might have been my Nikon D800, a massive full frame camera. It looked terrible. It was awful. Everything about it was bad, but it was a start. And somebody inspired me to just start. And it was horrible, horrible, horrible. And over time, it got better and better until now where it's, it's better. It's not perfect, but it, it's definitely better. Defy TV says, you definitely seem to embrace the grind to grow. You start out vlogging, you said, so did we. Did, did you notice along the way that certain types of videos just work better than those, e.g. tech? Yeah, I think most of the growth of this channel has come from not the vlogs because vlogging is just such a crowded space. And I think even when I was vlogging, I was just kind of more like documenting my life. And I miss the thing which my tech videos have really helped my channel grow. The, the key is value to the audience. Like, how is my life better for having watched your video? And a lot of vlogs are just, you know, they're fine, but it's just a look into somebody's life. And at the end of the day, you don't leave that going, wow, my life is better than it would have been before I started this vlog. I think I mean, obviously the tech videos, because they were tips and tricks and reviews and different things, people, they get something out of that because they're trying to learn, they're trying to figure something out and and you help them. And so they're also a lot more searchable. So that has definitely helped my growth. If I was to start a vlog again, I would be a lot more purposeful about trying to communicate something in every episode of value that was like inspirational or something that I'm learning or more than just, hey, here's my day and here's some nice B-roll and, and showing off the world. It would, it would really be around this idea of inspiring people to go on their own journey. And maybe everybody wants to do that, but you know, I think I can communicate reasonably well. I think I would be good at that. And I think that would actually help the vlogs actually grow the channel where yeah, it would be a little bit. Uh, it would be a little bit more focused around that. Whereas, yeah, the tech videos have been great because they're highly searchable and they're really valuable to the audience. And I think that's something everybody needs to learn how to grow in: is how do I provide more value than ever in my videos so that you know people want to continue to watch, and more than that, they actually want to share it with other people because they feel like it will help them. Jay Royal, I'm just over seven thousand subs. No big deal. Hey. That's awesome. And I was pleased to see Social, Bowl, Social Blade projects that I'll hit 450,000 in five years. Do you think Social Blade is accurate? Fingers crossed, LOL. The funny thing is, somebody just introduced me today to, I've watched, I followed Social Blade for a while, but future projections. And I was like, I didn't know about this thing. I was like, how long till I hit 100,000 subscribers? And it was like two, two and a half years or something. And it goes on. I don't know if they're accurate. I guess if you could maintain the same pace and continue, you know, growing your content, then maybe five years, 450,000. The thing that will be crazy is in five years, I think 450,000 will be the new 45,000 because there's just so many more creators all the time coming into YouTube and so many more consumers coming into YouTube that like my kids watch YouTube Kids, this like YouTube app uh, that's just for kids. And in a few years, what's going to end up happening is they're actually going to get their own YouTube accounts and then they'll start subscribing to people. And you're going to have this whole new generation of just millions and millions and millions of more subscribers. So it's a good time to be in because it's still early, but I don't think 450,000 will mean what it means today, which is you can live full time off YouTube pretty much, especially if you're in a channel where you can get affiliate commissions or different things like that. So anyway, that's awesome. I don't, I don't know how it'll work. Steve Tech Guy says, is it wrong to copy other ideas intentionally from other videos? I'm sure it's hard to avoid everything since everything has been done at least twice. What's your thoughts on this? Uh, I know, I think it was Dave Altizer who said this, but he, it's from somebody else. It's a famous quote, but he was the one who put me onto it, is steal like an artist. And there's nothing original in the world, like nothing original out there. But there's a difference to me from copying something and then being inspired by something. Like, I think it's awesome where you're like, cool, I want to try the the crazy B-roll like Peter McKinnon shoots, or I want to try some of these transitions that Casey does. The secret is it still has to be you and your personality and your different things that drive that, because guess what? Peter McKinnon didn't come up with sexy B-roll, and Casey Neistat didn't come up with the snap transitions or spin around and your clothes change. 
but they injected their own personality and their own take on it, and that's why they're able to do it. Now, obviously, if you if you copy those things from other people, people are always like, oh, you're just trying to be so-and-so, you're trying to be so-and-so. So what? Because you're actually learning valuable skills in doing that that push your creativity forward. So, no, I think it's fine to copy other people, but to me, it, it just has to be connected with who you are and... It can be tough because people are like, ah, I don't want to watch so much of this person or that person because all my stuff will just end up looking like them. And I think there's definitely truth in that. But there is also the more you watch of other people, the more you get inspired and the more it just kind of injects your own thing. But what I think is important is finding your own headspace to go, how am I going to make this thing my own? Both from a personality standpoint, but also from like a tech and just trying new things that you maybe haven't tried before, I think is important. But everybody steals. Everybody does. That's just, that's how it works. So, Pro Movie says, Your more tech videos was what got me to watch you. Yeah, I think that's how a lot of people have found me. So, uh, Steve Tech I, yes, tech videos. Ben, Ben Halsell, Final Cut Pro and Adobe X tutorials. Yo, neighbor. Ben, what is up? Ben is a great guy who. I think originally from the UK, somewhere there, for sure. But we now actually live in the same city, which is crazy. Ben does all sorts of cool tutorials for Final Cut Pro and, yeah, I guess Premiere Adobe tutorials. Now, I know from the Final Cut Pro ones because when I was just switching from Premiere to Final Cut, um, our kids were at swimming at the same time, and I would sit down and be like, Ben, how do you do this? How do you do that? How do you do that? And I'm sure he had a video on it, but he was very gracious and would end up showing it to me. So, which is, uh, which is awesome. Um, I got a few more minutes here. I'm just gonna, let's talk about a bit of gear update. EOS R, still really enjoying this camera. And um, I'm in this like Slack channel with a bunch of other creators. And it's crazy because not everybody loves it. It's polarizing, but there are more people like Potato Jet and Armando Ferrara and different people who are using this camera and going, this camera is so underrated on the spec sheet, but it, it just, it pumps out some great quality video. Uh, we're going to Vegas next week um, to cover more hockey stuff, Golden Knights. we got media passes, plus we're doing a bunch of media tours. We're going to a show. We're doing uh, yeah, a whole bunch of stuff. And I'm actually going to get to spend some real time with the camera, which I'm excited about. Um, I got the new and updated adapter, which you can't really see here, but the, you know, to adapt the lenses. And the original one was just the basic one, but I upgraded to this one, which has the dial on it. And what's awesome about this now is when you're vlogging, and I shoot in manual vlogging a lot of the time, is you'll see on your flip out screen that it's either too bright or too dark. And for me, when I vlog, I basically want it at f4 and 150th shutter speed, and I'm just adjusting ISO. Well, now on the ring, you can just do it right here without having to, I mean, this is aperture and this is shutter, and try and figure out, well, how do I get to ISO? Well, now it's just right here, which is, it's yeah, just initial testing with it has been actually awesome. It's actually such a cool feature. I mean, they've got in their new lenses, but being able to do that with any lens is, is cool. And I like the way footage is coming out of there. The other big acquisition because of our trip next week was I bought this. This is a Tamron 24 to 70 F 2.8 VC, which is vibration control USD, which I think is our ultrasonic drive generation two. It is, I was not expecting it to be this hefty. I even tried it on the camera store, and I just don't remember it being this hefty, but it is a serious, solid piece of glass. I mean, f2.8, 24 to 70, image stabilized, and this was like 1300 bucks Canadian, brand new, which is like $1,000 US, and here the Canon one is like 2150 and not image stabilized. So 2150 not image stabilized, 1300 image stabilized and the quality on it seems to be pretty good maybe for pixel peeping like kind of but in the reviews i looked at it like it was very negligible and for video and so far the autofocus seems pretty good i got to put it through real paces but you know with this this thing autofocus is like a beast once you get it set right in the mode so i'm excited about this what's crazy is I thought the Sigma 18 to 35 f1.8 was a massive, like a, a heavy lens. And I've been living in the crop sensor world or micro four thirds for a while. So this was like a big lens. 
and then now I put it besides this, and like this feels like 50% heavier, which maybe it is. I haven't looked at the specs, and just like so much beefier and meatier that when I have it on the EOS R, it feels like how this was on the M50, where I was like, man, there's so much weight on the front end, and now I'm just kind of laughing at myself because this is this is real real weight. Uh, other thing I saw in the camera store, which was interesting, was the Tamron 28 to 75 284 uh, Sony which is what we all want, which is native mirrorless lenses when they're when they're done, not native, but mirrorless lenses when they're done properly made for mirrorless cameras, is it is quite small. Like, it's very compact for being a 28 to 75 f4. Like, the size of it, it's like half the size of this. I mean, it's not image stabilized, which Sony takes care of that in body, but that's what we need more of, is more manufacturers making mirrorless lens systems where they can make them smaller because I think of the difference between the sensor in the lens. Anyway, I don't know. It's some kind of magic, but we need more of that. So I can't wait for more native RF mount lenses or from everybody. So uh, that's a little bit of a gear update. The other thing in my life that I've actually, it's so cheesy, but I just love it so much. This is a SanDisk 500 gig, uh, SanDisk Extreme Portable SSD. 500 gigabytes. It is so fast and it's got native USB-C, which is good for my MacBook Pro. But I needed something a little bit bigger than what I had previously. And before I had like a big, like solid state drive enclosure thing. And this is tiny and it's so fast. I just love it so much. It's uh, it's nice. So Dylan Tazioli. Hello. Hi, Dylan. Dylan's been shooting uh, actually a lot of our Honor Justin and Greg channel. He's been shooting and editing a ton of stuff for us, which is awesome. Uh, Steven Tech Guy says, and the, fo fo the focus noise, the focus noise in videos on the Tamron. Yeah, that's uh, definitely something that I'm going to be testing out. So far, it's like you hear it in the room, but you could also hear the Sigma and it didn't get picked up in the motors. And people talked about that too with the 16 to 35. People said, oh, you can't use it because it gets picked up in the, in the microphone. And it, I have not had any peeps of any focus noise. So we'll find out if that's the case with the 2470. Obviously, if you're using the microphones built in, yeah, that would not work at all. But I'm I'm actually hopeful that it'll be quiet enough that, um, yeah, it ends up working out. Andy Tran, what's up, Justin? Hey, Andy, welcome to the stream. It's awesome. Josh Walker, what's up, man? Oh, guys, you're coming in. It's great. Uh, what else do we have in comments here? J. Royal says, my list videos will always get way more views than some of my more obscure review videos, but I keep doing the reviews because of the few people that really want to see them. High value for a few people. This is something that's really important for people's channels to understand is I don't do these live videos because I think that they're going to get thousands of views. I do these live videos because, well, one, I like hanging out with you guys, but two, it's important on your channel that you go deep with, with the core people or some people that... Not all your content needs to be for the masses, that you also need to take care of the people who are your biggest supporters or people who like you for a certain reason. And so that's great. You go, hey, these other videos get a lot more views, but I have a select group of people that really like these review videos. Keep doing those videos then because the, the, the number one thing you need to care about is that there is, whether it's one person or 10 people or 50 people or 10,000 people subscribed to you, those people are following you for a reason and they're giving you their time. And even if it's 50 people, that's that's humbling, like super duper humbling. And so, yeah, keep going with it. Absolutely. Uh, Dylan, that drive is amazing. Yeah, you've transferred some stuff. You know, it's so fast. Jay Royal, also rest in peace, M50. Helped convince me to get it after using my phone for well over a year. So thanks for that. The M50, I think it's the best value camera on the market for creators. Absolutely. Now... For people who are kind of like like getting started into video and aren't like pure cinema enthusiasts, because I think for a similar price, you can get something like this Panasonic G7, which shoots like better 4K. I guess, I mean, the crop factor ends up being similar, uh, but you get a little bit more controls, dual dials, and, you know, some more things with that. You get into a G85 for a little bit more. You get in body image stabilization, yada, yada, yada. The M50 is just such great value because the colors look great. The autofocus is great. It's got the audio input jack. The 1080p quality is awesome. And the, the thing just works. And it's in a really nice compact package with a flip-out touchscreen that makes it so handy. So yeah, M50, I'm just, I'm going to continue recommending it to so many people until Sony has gone, like I was going to say Sony fixes, you know, or does something special. 
they were seemed like so close to releasing a couple of cameras, a really high-end crop sensor camera that everybody was very hot on the trails and then just kind of fell into oblivion. And the A7S III, which maybe in the new year when Panasonic gets close, but like, where'd you go, Sony? Like, where's that crop sensor camera with the flip screen, 4K 60, 180 or 240 frame per second, 1080p, and better rolling shutter performance and a, a screen that is actually visible outside if you're doing 4K or super slow-mo? Like, you still have some work to do. You should get on that. I know the A7 III is crushing, so... Uh, Andy Tran, are you shooting on the USR now? Yeah, I've got the USR here. Oh, sorry, I should turn that. It was turned a little bit before. Um, I did an upgrade because, well... We do a lot of videos where we get paid for doing the videos. And the low light on the M50 at times was just like a bit embarrassing. We were doing a video with Tourism for Las Vegas. And we were in the back of the buffet at Caesars Palace. And I needed to have the ultra wide on to fit Greg and I in there. And I had to go to ISO 12,800 in a restaurant that wasn't even like that dimly lit. But it was kind of dim back there. And like it was just, it was unusable. Like it just, it, it looked bad. Um, and so that's the big reason for the R is just that it's a better low light performance. That's, that's really a big part of it. I like this more cinematic look of full frame, which is nice. Um, but that, that was really the thing where I went, ah, I got to invest a little bit more in that and being able to have full frame with constant F4, like it's bigger and it's heavier and it's a little more harder to wield. But, um, yeah, USR, and then I've got a G7 here, uh, which is a super handy camera for anything, like, live stream related. It's what we use for our Justin Gregg live show. ba 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 Yeah, that should explain that. Uh, Steve Tech, I follow you because you use Canon. I find you funny and you record things that I don't see on most popular channels. Anything else is a bonus. Keep what you're doing, and thanks. Hey, thank you. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Dylan Tazioli, shutter at 150th for in the restaurant. Yeah, I think so. I maybe would drop to 125 if I'm desperate. That's still been an ISO 6400, and it still could have been messy, but it could have been at 125th. I don't remember. It's a little ways back. Anyway, guys, I think that's uh, I think that's about it for this evening. Thank you guys so much for hanging out, as always, and keep challenging yourselves. I appreciate it. Um, I can't thank you guys enough. Again, two more days, and we'll probably be at that 10,000 mark, which is a pretty cool milestone. And uh, yeah. I'm just super jazzed. Anyway, you guys are awesome. Realize I don't have the tab to stop streaming. Here we go. All right. Anyway, have a great evening, and we will see you guys soon.